I was born in Dublin, but moved to the States when I was six months old. So I'm an American, but I still have Irish family on my father's side. A few years ago, I returned to Ireland to bury my grandfather. To the beautiful Emerald Isle, although my family's, uh, father's family would never refer to Ireland as that, or even as Ireland for that matter. To them, it was Ulster. They were Northern Irish Protestants, and they'd be happy to remind you, should you ever forget. My father's first experience with the Neighborhood Watch when he was a young boy in the Protestant coastal town of Newton Arts. One day, while coming home from school, he saw a group of armed, black, uniformed men lingering outside a house. My father had never seen anyone in Ireland brandish this kind of weaponry. When he came home, he told his father what he saw. My grandfather then told my father to come with him, and they made their way to the house. The house belonged to a Sergeant Jack Taylor of the B Specials, someone my grandfather knew. The B Specials were a paramilitary civilian group formed to assist the police in enforcement of the law. My grandfather informed Jack that he and his men scared his son, and he, could he reassure him that everything was all right? Taylor looked down at my father and said, Don't worry, Raymond. We only shoot Catholics. <laughs> On the way home, my granddad told him, I want you to remember what you saw today. My grandfather hated Catholics, but he knew injustice when he saw it. My grandfather was actually an Englishman from Kent. He moved to Northern Ireland because of its beauty, even if he wasn't particularly fond of the people. He was a mechanic turned shopkeeper, a World War II veteran from the North African and Italian campaigns. He was smart, book smart, but had no check on his emotions, which led him to say hateful things. Things like asking my father, what was it like to have a Catholic son? He was livid about the way I was raised. My father frequently had to calm him down. With my grandfather, rage would come first and justification followed later. In that way, he was very much an Ulster proddy. When the Irish Troubles began, the Troubles being years of unrest between the Catholic and Protestant populations, every neighborhood became a microcosm of the national crisis. Individuals would talk about Catholic or Protestant loved ones to show that they weren't bigots, but sure enough, the rage slipped in. The love was forgotten, and these once cherished people fell into the designation of enemy. My grandfather had never quite forgiven my father for marrying an Irish-American woman and raising his two sons Catholic. Dad had been kicked out of the clan more than once for this transgression. I think the only reason they forgave him the first time is because it felt so good kicking him out, they wanted to do it again. <laughs> My mother met my father at the Abbey Theater in Dublin in the late 70s. She was the exotic costume designer straight out of Stanford University. And my father was the slightly less exotic Northern Irish Protestant actor in the theater company. Irish affirmative action stating you had at least one Northerner in the troupe. Their meeting would have been more romantic if my mother hadn't almost been killed in an anti-Irish bomb explosion in downtown Dublin. The bombers were defending Ulster from IRA. It was literally a situation having turned left instead of right that saved her life. My mother described to me how during the explosion the glass rippled like water. I couldn't quite get a sense of how that looked until I saw the Matrix. <laughs> My grandmother was Northern Irish. Whenever I visualize her, I not, think not of a conversation we had or a setting, but rather that of a woman looking down at her embroidery, stitching out her latest scarf, meditative and absorbed. She was a friendly woman, always included the word dear whenever she spoke. Once while watching Reservoir Dogs, I heard her cluck her tongue and mildly say, those dogs certainly like to say the word fuck, don't they, dear? <laughs> I glanced over at her, and she never even looked up. The support from my grandfather was absolute. If there was an argument, and there were many, she would support whatever his position was. In fact, I think the only time she ever refused him was on his deathbed. He asked her if she wanted to come with him. Her response, a pat on the hand, a, a no, dear. You go ahead and do that yourself. <laughs> so I returned to the island of my birth to bury the man who loved slash hated me. I've been told to keep quiet and that the Northern Irish had their own way of doing things. The police were little more than referees and that every town in Ulster had its own vigilante club or neighborhood watch. Northern Ireland boasted the lowest crime rate in the world, although not surprising considering that, for instance, if you were caught stealing someone's Mazda, you were capped, as in you were shot in the kneecap and limped around for the rest of your life. 
The punishments only grew more extreme from there. My grandmother gave me a tour when I arrived, exposed me to the rich cultural landscape of the North, while also showing me all the buildings that had been bombed over the years. Now there's the post office, dear. The IRA bombed that seven years ago. And there's the social services station that was bombed five years ago. And that's the butcher shop. It was bombed three years ago. <laughs> oh, that wasn't the IRA, dear. That was a radical vegetarian group. <laughs> True story. <laughs> uh, my father took me to a Protestant fishing village that was famous for its self-governance. There were loyalist, anti-Irish, anti-Catholic slogans everywhere. My father explained to me the giant red hand shown prominently in the middle of town. That, son, is the red hand of Ulster. Aha, uh -huh, I responded. And what exactly is the red hand of Ulster, dad? Well, Ben, the red hand of Ulster is the symbol of Protestant Ireland. The myth is that two men were racing from Scotland to Ireland by boat. They agreed whomever reached the shores of Ulster first would be king. When one of the men realized he was losing, he chopped off his hand and threw it to the beach, thereby winning the race. <laughs> a bloody hand lying on the shore became a symbol of our people. <laughs> <laughs> Certainly gives you insight about our kinfolk, doesn't it? <laughs> I also discovered the village had a very proactive neighborhood watch. You see, years ago, the townsfolk figured out that they could enforce the law just fine by themselves. Once they came to that logical conclusion, they did the only reasonable thing and promptly burned down their police station. <laughs> Again, no joke. I asked my dad, how do the different neighborhood groups figure out who is Catholic and who is Protestant just by looking at someone? They don't, he responded. They don't recognize you, the locals will just put a beating on you. I've had Protestant friends attacked by other parties just because they are outsiders. Made sense. The church that held my grandfather's service was beautiful and intimate, which just accentuated my feelings of being out of place with my extended family of strangers. One of the few, th one of the few that I knew was my fellow Paul Bear's distant uncle, Kelly. He was a super, which is a derogatory term left over from the Irish famine. It refers to an Irish Celt who changed their religion from a Catholic to Protestant in exchange for a bowl of soup. I remind myself not to mention that as I walked up to greet him. Okay, Ben, don't say super, don't say super, don't say super. Hey, Uncle Kelly, it's super to meet you. <laughs> While the service was going on, I tried to work out my feelings over my grandfather's death. It was complicated. It was a shame to see my grandfather pass, but it also felt like a burden lifted from our family's shoulders. He hated that I was raised Catholic, but he also seemed proud of me. He'd often take me out to eat and would chat for hours. He wanted to be in our lives, but got angry at the slightest provocation, making every family interaction an intense affair. Nothing was ever simple with him. I was carrying my grandfather's coffin to the hearse. I saw one of the old neighborhood watch clubs across the street. I'd seen that vigilante's group parade the day before. It was an unusual parade. There might not have been floats, but there were instruments. There were musicians. They marched in procession, but what stood out was that no one was smiling. It consisted of hard men blowing horns and banging war drums while sporting prison-style loyalist hats on their weld-muscled arms. Imagine if the Aryan Brotherhood had a band camp and you'll get the idea. These were clearly men of violence. I thought what my grandfather would have made of it. Would he approve, disapprove, feel proud, feel ashamed? Would he have seen himself in their eyes or in mine? Would he have asked them to own up to the fear they are creating amongst my family? No answer would be forthcoming. I felt my grandfather's weight dig painfully into my shoulder as I looked on his country's legacy and the aftershocks it dealt my grandfather and everyone else in its wake. Me and my grandfather's relationship would be like that, him and his whole family, his neighborhood, or even the whole damned country. Complicated and unresolved.
Ben Hardy, ladies and gentlemen.